All righty. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Tucker Edmonds, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture. Welcome to the seventh episode of the second season of the Center's Religion and series. Religion and is a series of monthly conversations between leading academics and practitioners hosted by the Center to, en to engage and enhance critically important conversations on the state of religion and American culture uh, in the world and, to, and, and around the world, really. The, the sixth episode was an engaging and thought-provoking discussion on religion, race, activism, and the vote, where our panelists engaged the upcoming election cycle, the role of engaged activism, and the future of democracy. We continue to have an amazing year where we've had engaged scholars, practitioners, and activists who take seriously the categories of religion and American culture and connect them to the questions that we that are being engaged in contemporary issues in our country and around the world. We have two more episodes for this for the remainder of this season, uh, and then we will all come together, hopefully in person, for our biennial conference here in Indianapolis. So please be on the lookout or check out our website for information about the upcoming biennial conference. You can find information on our social social media outlets on our website. Registration is open and this is an amazing time where we invite scholars and graduate students and practitioners to engage the most pressing issues in our field and to have a really an open and an innovative roundtable discussion to do that. Please remember everyone that's that's joined us today that you can return to earlier episodes from the beginning of this year and from last season via YouTube and the websites um, and, the, and the center's website. I want to thank the scholars who took time out of their schedules last month. Thank you, Dr. Lerone Martin, Dr. Leah Gunning Francis, and Dr. Bashir Mohammed uh, for your engaging and insightful comments last month. Today, we are turning to religion and Jackie Robinson and the long shadow of integration. Um, I want to start off by saying that you know this month or next month on April 15th, we're going to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of Robinson's first game in Major League Baseball, right? And so we're talking about this time, April 15th, 1947, when the color line was crossed and Jackie Robinson famously turned to Branch Rickey and, and promised that he was going to deploy not only his faith, but his identity as a Black man to change forever the way that we thought about America and America. America's national pastime. And so, so today we have brought together uh, journalists and writers, theologians and scholars, right, to think about the impact of that event 75 years ago, uh, to, to look more deeply at the history of Jackie Robinson and the crossing of that line, but also the ways in which these continued or presumed obligations of religious faith and nationalism impact the way that we think about play, uh, uh, sports players, especially players of color, and we want to think about this deep intersection between American studies, religion, and sport. And so I am so excited to invite you to lean back in your chair and get ready for a compelling dialogue between the scholars that we've invited for this afternoon. I want to remind everyone that throughout today's session, we are asking folks to submit questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom. So that's where Chris and I will be looking for questions as we get to the end of the hour, and this will enable the host and the panelists to engage these questions um, as they facilitate this important conversation uh, at this important time in history. So let me introduce our host for today's conversation. Chris Lamb is the Chair of Journalism and Public Relations and the Professor of Journalism at Indiana University, Purdue University. Um, Chris Lamb is, the, uh, is an author, a, a lecturer, a historian, a satirist, and a columnist. Lamb is the author of over 11 books, and two, including two that were published in 2020, The Art of Political Put-Down, The Greatest Comebacks, Reposts and Retorts in History, and Sports Journalism, A History of Glory, fame and technology. He has written extensively on sports, race, and media. And before becoming a college professor, he's worked with 
newspapers and magazines. And since becoming a professor, he has written over 250 articles for publications as widely known as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Christian Science Monitor. He also recently published a book with one of, his, with one of our panelists today, Michael Long, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of seconds. So I want to hand this conversation right over to our host for the afternoon as he will introduce the, um, the three panelists for this afternoon. And we're going to have an, an engaging and thoughtful conversation on Jackie Robinson and the long shadow of integration. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'd, I'd like to introduce the three panelists. Uh, one, Michael Long is the co-author of Jackie Robinson, A Spiritual Biography, which looks a lot like this. You can buy this in a lobby as you leave. He's also the editor of three books on Robinson, First Class Citizenship, The Civil Rights Letters of Jackie Robinson, A Beyond Home Plate, Jackie Robinson After Baseball, and 42 Today, Jackie Robinson and His Legacy. Uh, Long appeared in Ken Burns' documentary about Robinson. Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux will publish his next book on Robinson, a biography for middle graders. Uh, next is Randall Jelks, who's a professor of uh, African and African-American studies at the University of Kansas. Uh, he is the author of two award-winning books, uh, African-Americans in the Furniture City, The Struggle for Civil Rights, uh, Struggle in Grand Rapids and Benjamin Elijah May, schoolmaster of the movement of biography. Uh, Jelks contributed to the collection of essays in uh, Michael Long's 42, uh, Jackie Robinson and his legacy. And finally, Carmen uh, uh, Ananko Fernandez is the professor of Hispanic theology and ministry at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. A Latino theologian, her publications include books, chapters, journal articles, and popular media commentaries in the National Catholic Reporter and Commonweal on, on Latino the, uh, theology, sport and theology with a focus on baseball, on Pope Francis and sports. Uh, she is completing El Santo Baseball and the Canonization of Roberto Clemente, which will be published by Mercer University Press. Uh, like my comments uh, are, uh, are my introductory comments will be two weeks from now, as Joseph said, it will be the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson taking the field for the first time for the Brooklyn Dodgers. In doing so, he changed uh, baseball and American society forever. The feeling was if Robinson could integrate baseball, it meant that blacks could have equal opportunity in jobs, in schools and housing. Uh, this was the most important story about race in the country between World War II and the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Uh, Robinson uh, confronted institutionalized racism before the Brown decision, before Rosa Parks uh, refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white man, uh, before anyone had really heard of Martin Luther King, and before the civil rights movement had a name. Uh, 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 Martin Luther King said that Robinson's example of confronting racial bigotry without regard for his own safety compelled the minister to confront racial bigotry himself. Back in the day when integration wasn't fashionable, King said of Robinson, he underwent the trauma and humiliation of and the loneliness that comes with being a pilgrim walking the lonesome byways toward the high road of freedom. He was a sit-inner before sit-ins and a freedom writer before freedom writes. Uh, uh, Robinson's story is a baseball story, yes, but it strikes at the very heart of what Gunnar Meyerdahl called America's racial uh, dilemma. He is the hero of Joseph Campbell's hero's jersey, uh, uh, hero's journey. His story is a love story with his wife, Rachel, and he, but that's not why we're here. This is a story about Jackie Robinson and religion and faith and salvation. Um, uh, this story is usually told through the white lens of white writers or the white lens of his white savior, Branch Rickey, the president of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who signed Robinson to a contract and told Robinson what he needed to do, what he needed to sacrifice for baseball's great experiment to succeed. I'd like to start this discussion with the first meeting between Ricky and Robinson in Ricky's Brooklyn office, where Ricky reads uh, from Papini's Life of Christ. Um, I'd like to start with Mike Long, and then we'll go to Carmen. Uh, Mike, why don't you uh, kind of tell us what Ricky and Robinson uh, talked about 
in that conversation. Sure. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for being with us today. Uh, when Ricky and Robinson met, you know, Ricky had quite a few things on his plate that he needed to address. And one of them was uh, related to Robinson's character. And Ricky had done all kinds of uh, investigations, and he knew that Robinson had a temper like a rattlesnake, as uh, one of his teammates in the Negro Leagues put it. Uh, Robinson was not, uh, what shall I call it, what shall I say, a nonviolent. <laughs> he was not naturally peaceful. Uh, he was inclined to strike back. He was, he knew that. And Ricky knew that as well. And Ricky was concerned about that. So why was he concerned about that particular part of Robinson's character is another important piece of the background leading into the answer to your question. And Ricky uh, was concerned that uh, the critics would be proven true if Robinson uh, came in the field, uh, went onto the diamond and engaged in a fight. Uh, critics were saying we can't have black people and white people be on the diamond because there would be riots. There would be riots on the diamond. There'd be riots in the stands. This itself was a racist trope. Uh, nevertheless, it was a concern that Ricky had. So he was concerned about Robinson's fiery character. He was concerned about the possibility of so-called riots in the stands. And with these two major concerns in mind, he turned, he turned to the 1921 version of Giovanni Papini's Life of Christ, which was a bestseller uh, still at the time. And in, and in that book, he turned especially to a passage where Papini quotes uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, and this is Matthew 5. And I think I'll just turn to Carmen, who I'm sure knows the passage pretty well, uh, to pick it up from there. Carmen, want to jump yeah. in here? Yeah, I, I've actually found it fascinating that um, while it's a turn to Matthew um, 5, 38, 40, 41, because there, there'd be another passage in Luke, but he turns to Matthew 5, 38, 40, because that's what Papini was reflecting on. I find it more fascinating that nobody asked the question, why didn't he hand um, Robinson the Bible to read the Sermon on the Mount, but instead he hands him Papini, which was the 19, uh, the 1923 is when the English language version comes out by Dorothy Canfield mm -hmm. Fisher. And it's, it's so already you got like an interpretive move. So it's Dorothy Canfield Fisher putting an Italian, formerly agnostic Catholic convert reflecting on World War I and trying to address that. And it's that well-thumbed book that, uh, that I'm not, I haven't found evidence that actually Robinson was familiar with it, but apparently was a favorite of, um, of uh, Branch Rickey's. And, and what he does is he turns to, so I would even say it's not that he turns to the Sermon on the Mount, he turns to Papini's interpretation of Turn yeah. the Other Cheek. And, and, and in that sense, um, I think there's been less study of what are the underlying theological assumptions because everyone just assumes a certain interpretation of turn the other cheek. But in Papini, it had this meaning that it, it meant that there would be, um, in the face of violence, the extraordinary person would absorb abusive violence because if you retaliated or sought revenge, that was problematic because it, considered, it continued the cycle of violence. The second part was if, if you, fl if you decided to run away to face another day, in other words, flight in order to save the situation, it was considered the kind of blame the victim, then you just inspired somebody to go punch in the face precisely because you fled, so you deserved it because you were a coward. So therefore, Papini imagined in, a, in kind of dealing with the aftermath of the violence and destruction of World War I, was that the extraordinary hero or the person who did the sacrifice as he was interpreting um, Matthew 5, uh, 3840, was this person who stood, absorbed all of the abuse and violence, and then people would be so impressed that this had been done, that there, this was non-resistance and that there would be peace. And um, I think that's what then shapes this sort of martyrdom because Ricky himself uses that term to explain what he wants on the field. He says he wants a martyr on the field. 
and that somebody who therefore would take the violence and, and I guess there's, there's a positive way of looking at it. I, I, I guess I come to it with the sort of, you know, suspicion from the Latino side of the house that says, um, and so why should people who are being discriminated against have to endure violence that's unnecessary? And then I wonder how that then shapes what comes of the, of the Robinson and Ricky narratives. Um, what's even more fascinating is if you look at the telling of the tales, um, they don't, the, the earliest ones talk of Papini, but by the time you're getting to the books after 1964, Papini disappears. Hmm. And there, there's no mention that it was the life of Christ. So I, I'm more fascinated as to why they didn't go to the common text because you've all studied, you know, you're, I've read your stuff, both Randall and Mike on, on Methodism and, and Ricky and um, Robinson. And I was wondering why didn't, that was the common text, you know, why, why to Papini, I guess is my burning question. In Ricky's response, or Ricky tells Robinson what he has to do, and Robinson's response is, I have another cheek, Mr. Ricky. Yeah, um, that, but I want to ask a follow-up question uh, with you, Carmen. Is turning the other cheek becomes an, it, 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 this is, comes from your essay, uh, it, turning the other cheek becomes an expectation of, of subsequent Black and Brown players in martyrdom is a way of domesticating dangerous memories and complicated inconvenient and, and complicated inconvenient prophets such as Jackie Robinson. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that when you set the expectation that in order to appease white folk, whether those white folk are the your, your fellow players, the folks in the stands, um, the greater society, because the only way you're going to do this is in a gradual way so that they can get used to you. And if you do that, then what you put on to black players and then subsequently Afro Latinos and brown players who, who came is an expectation that you have to suck it up uh, for reconciliation and peace to happen. So the black or the brown player becomes the unnecessary suffering servant or martyr to save the white race from itself and its prejudices. And, and I have to wonder about what does that then indicate? And again, I'm coming at it from a theolo theologian's perspective. What does that then say about the assumptions that we place that have specifically Christian roots? And, I, and I'm thinking of some of the work of Willie Jennings who questions the violence in some of our own Christianity and the racisms there and how we perpetuate it with, with our uncritical interpretations of scripture. And, and I think Papini is responding to a context and Ricky takes that and reorients it for a new context, which Mike pointed out, that kind of social context of um, racism embedded in US society as reflected in baseball. Uh, what happens is that you see Ricky all the way through 1957, when he integrates the Pittsburgh Pirates, first with Kurt Roberts, and then you have like shortly right after that, um, Roberto Clemente, giving these guys the exact same advice he told Robinson saying, you don't want to upset the milk bucket. In other words, you, you want guys to, you know, get used to it. Well, this, this is now 1957, you know, this is 10 years later. Um, it gets so embedded in the narrative that you even find black journalists then referring to it as the Papini doctrine or the Papini philosophy because Ricky also calls it that. And, and, and so I, I just find that that's just an interesting thing that really has not been as developed in our conversations about um, what Robinson had to absorb and the more basic question, why? <laughs> you know, and what was fair and why does that continue? Because Clemente, for example, catches it because he refuses, like Robinson does after his rookie year, to take it. And once Robinson starts talking back, he's no longer anybody's interest because it's, it's, it, it blows the, the paradigm that got set in motion by Branch Rickey, which was the suffering servant who takes it, the strong man. I want to come back to this a little bit later, but there's so much of the idea that a lot of white Americans judge racism by what, how white America views it and not, and not the way that people of color uh, view it. And, I, you know, but I want to come back to that in a little bit. In the movie of 42, uh, Ricky, who's played by Harrison Ford, says something to the words of Robinson is a Methodist. I'm a Methodist. God is a Methodist. We can't go wrong. Well, he didn't really, 
he didn't really say that, but it makes good Hollywood. Uh, now I'd like to move, uh, I could talk about the fact that, that Ricky and Robinson were both Methodists and how their Methodism shaped their character and put them on a path toward each other. Um, and part of this has to do with Ricky growing up and, and going to Ohio Wesleyan and coaching the baseball team and checking into uh, a, ho a hotel at, at uh, Notre Dame in South Bend and his star black player was not, uh, Charlie Thomas was not allowed to check into the hotel. And Ricky tells the manager of the hotel, can he stay with me? Um, because in those days, a black could stay with a white if he was a servant. And so this, this so Charlie Thomas, 6'2", 220 pounds, ends up sleeping on a cot in Ricky's room. Ricky looks over at some point and Charlie Thomas is taking his fist, his arm and rubbing against his skin saying, if I weren't so black, black skin, black skin, if I weren't so black, I would be accepted. And Robinson is so moved by this that 40 years later, uh, when he meets with Robinson and he signs Robinson, he tells this story. But, but Randall, in your chapter, in Mike's book, 42, uh, you write about uh, uh, Robinson and his Methodism and how Robinson came to his Methodist. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, I, I also want to uh, pivot for one second to, to, to Carmen um, because it's about this uh, Methodism. Uh, the Methodism that Jackie Robinson uh, grew up with was very socially engaged and active. Uh, uh, Carl Downs, the real clergy person who really is transformative in his life, is engaged in the social gospel. And uh, the, the Black social gospelers were also engaged with Gandhi. And I think it's really important for us to, to remember that root of, uh, and uh, uh, when uh, Carl Downs becomes the president, uh, I want to say Houston Tillerson, but the uh, Houston College down in, in Austin, Texas, um, Robinson goes down to coach. Uh, there's a famous talk given down there by a man, uh, a Christian mystic call named Howard Thurman. And Thurman uh, uh, gives the talk of a, of a book uh, that would be, uh, become very important in, 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 in the civil rights movement, but among religious activists called Jesus and the Disinherited because he goes uh, and he tells the story of meeting Gandhi uh, in 1935 in India, spending a year in India, uh, touring India and, and, and the kind of revolution that Gandhi was leading against the British. And it gets into, and, and Downs invites uh, Howard Thurman uh, to, uh, to give a talk about that. And that begins the, the, the talk of Jesus and the disinherited. What does Jesus have to say with to the to the uh, man or woman with their backs against the wall? Uh, and it's an important uh, important kind of uh, a nuance is to understand that what attracted Jackie Robinson to uh, particularly Methodism what, uh, uh, was that all mothers wanted their sons to go to church. I don't care what church it was. You know, uh, growing up, um, I, I wrote in a book about my grandmother making me watch Billy Graham as well as Bishop Fulton Sheen because she thought it was good religious education uh, for me to, you know, to watch either one of them, maybe diametrically opposed at times, but I had to watch both of them. A, a kid growing up part of my life in New Orleans, I had to watch both Catholic and uh, um, uh, a, a Protestant evangelical. So, so Robinson is filled with and um, uh, Downs this interpretation of Methodism that the, it, it be engaged in and socially vibrant and active things. And it's Downs who marries he and Rachel I Isom uh, Isom uh, at, at at the time. Uh, and so, to for us to think about that. Robinson is has a lens about these things as well. It's not that he's coming at it a, a, a blank slate uh, that he has heard uh, about uh, the work of uh, Howard Thurman engaging with Gandhi 
uh, he's heard through that vast network that churches are uh, internationally uh, bringing people through. So it's important to know that Robinson and, and Ricky, Ricky had a charitable way of looking at this thing as I read him. Uh, he's, um, and he's a, he's a owner of a baseball team. And I always wanna say he's an owner. And remember, Kirk Flood is not till 69 that <laughs> challenges the reserve clause. He's still an owner, no matter how religious he is, he wants to make a profit. And if he has a black player that's gonna instantly brawl back with the other players, he's fearful that that won't be uh, attractive enough. And I, I, I don't think we should uh, take the monetary uh, level out there. But spiritually, Robinson is deeply, uh, a, a deeply spiritual man. Um, and, and, and that spirituality gives him the kind of dignity uh, that you can go out and, and fight. Because as we know, he was nearly court-martialed uh, for, for fighting. So he wasn't a, a passive and he was an officer um, in, in the uh, US Army. He had played football at UCLA. So he wasn't uh, uh, adverse to physical contact. Um, and so I, I really want us to think that he has his own world and they are coming together. There is a meeting of the minds because Robinson knows through Downs who is used to recruit him that this is an opportunity to open up uh, a lane for baseball players, period. Um, and to make baseball a, a truly uh, national uh, pastime uh, than, than it had pretended to be. Uh, and, uh, and to kind of make a new American consensus, so to speak, that, that, that moment in time. And uh, Randall, there is this, there's this transformation that Robinson goes through. He comes to Methodist and religion a little late um, you know, we, uh, you and I may have had the same mother who wanted us to, you know, sit down and go to church and have some religion. Mally Robinson was the same way. And, but Robinson is a juvenile delinquent. There's a point where a cop, you know, puts, uh, tries to arrest him or arrest him and puts a gun in his ribs. Um, and now what I want to do is transition a little bit back to Mike. Uh, 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 well, I just want to say, just Chris, I just want to say, juvenile delinquent is the term he was using that, that was used by the police of, for lots of black men and young black men, including myself, even if you're going to school. So I want to, uh, he, he's, he's just a kid out there trying to figure it out. And I think that would be a fair way to put it up. And Policing in California of his day was as brutal as it was when Rodney King came on. And then it hasn't changed and-, and uh, Well, it has changed point. some in, in the last years. I, I give the LA police in that, uh, more credit for that, but it, it was pretty br brutal even then. But the idea of what happened to Robinson, or, or, or what happened to Michael Brown could have happened to Robinson right. as well. And it did happen to a lot of kids. Right. I remember the era, this is the era also of the Zoot Suit Riot uh, in, in, in California. So policing, I, I, would, I never liked the description of Riot. He was a juvenile, he was an angry kid, a mad kid, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out dignity in a, a world that didn't dignify him. That's all. That's my, that's my point there. Sure, that's a that's a good point. Thank you. And also uh, now, Mike, I know you've done a lot of work on it. it, it, it we, we have sort of three or four Methodists in in Robinson's life, and and I want you to kind of address the impact that that his mother Mally Robinson had as well. And then we move from Mally Robinson to. Uh, Reverend Downs to uh, to Branch Ricky to racial ism uh, Robinson kind of in the middle. But Mike, tell me about um, uh, Robinson's mother, Mally. Sure, sure, I'll take a liberty here and pivot to two earlier points, if I may. First, is that right. Pasadena Police Department had former members of the Ku Klux Klan on it. Uh, so let's keep that in mind. Uh, 
that was a brutal place for us. Randall was absolutely right. Then I want to go to Carmen's point in 1947. I understand there are problems with uh, asking Robinson to turn the other cheek, uh, especially given the, the racism and violence that he faced. On the other hand, I do know that Robinson was fully an agent in 1947. Robinson was not the type of person to do something that he just didn't want to do. So if he's going to turn the other cheek in 1947, it's Robinson who's turning the other cheek willingly. Uh, so I want us to keep that in mind as well. He's not a victim here in 1947. He's somebody with a strong backbone uh, and he is taking on uh, what he later characterizes as redemptive suffering so that black people can enter uh, the baseball diamond in Major League Baseball. And that, that, that embrace of redemptive suffering really extends back to his mother, Mally. Uh, his mother, Mally, uh, Robinson was born in 1919 in Georgia. Georgia was an awful place uh, for a black person in 1919. And she decides after her husband leaves her, Jerry, uh, to take the five kids, put them on a train. She calls it the Freedom Train and to leave uh, Georgia and head to the promised land. Where's the promised land? Well, it's always in California, right? So they end up in Pasadena and they take the freedom train as she calls it. Uh, this is an exodus, right? So this is part of the great migration that's going on in the United States at the time, but it's an exodus. An ex it's an exodus from a land of slavery, a land of sharecropping, vicious sharecropping to a land where she can make some opportunity. And Robinson latches onto that as an important lesson for his own life. And she teaches Robinson that freedom is a gift from God on the one hand, but it's also something that we need to fight for right here and right now. And so she had this own homegrown version of social gospel, as Randall was talking about, uh, the black social gospelers later on, and even during this time. Well, she has her own homegrown version of social gospel. And one of the principal tenets is freedom is a gift from God, but you better fight for it right here and right now if you want to enjoy it. And so Robinson never has this pie in the sky theology where he thinks that he will experience salvation someday out there. And that's the only thing he's going to experience. He has this important lesson from Mally that freedom is to be grasped right here and right now. So that's one important spiritual lesson that he grows up with. Another important spiritual lesson that he grows up with is that the color of his skin is full of dignity. This is a huge lesson in Pasadena as he's growing up. Robinson did not hide the color of his skin. You know, one of the things that Rachel talks about is being attracted to him at UCLA because he wore these bright starched white shirts that accentuated the darkness of his skin. He was proud of the color of his skin. She loved that about him. Where'd that come from? Well, Mally taught him to be proud of the color of his skin. She said it was a gift from God. She also taught him this really peculiar lesson about Adam and Eve. She said that Adam and Eve were both initially uh, black, people. And then uh, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God discovered them, they were scared white as ghosts. <laughs> so, so their original color is black. And she teaches this lesson to young Jack, telling him that color black for skin is God's original design for humanity. So he grows up thinking, that he is part of God's original, original design. She teaches him that freedom is something to be fought for, that the color of his skin is full of dignity. And with those two important lessons, he heads in to life. Those are some of the more important lessons that Mally taught him. Chris, you yeah. and I talked about, I mean, Michael, you and I talked about this before, about her her lesson. And I mentioned to you this, 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 this kind of, um, cosmological thing went around Georgia because Elijah Poole, who will become Elijah Muhammad, also has a kind of cosmology about race. And he's also a Black Georgian who leaves the state. Uh, yeah. and, and, and he leaves uh, his holiness uh, tradition uh, to form what would become the uh, become the, the leading minister in what, what the nation of Islam. And so uh, yeah, it's a, a very interesting 
thing. I, I, I wish I could trace this more, uh, the kind of uh, uh, this heritage, but it, I find it fascinating. How does, how does Robinson demonstrate his faith? I mean, you know, Mike or, or Randall or Carmen, how does he, um, does he wear his religion on his sleeve? We, you, you mentioned his, his, his white shirts, um, you know, but where, explain to me how private or public was his expression of religion? Something I wish I, uh, uh, Chris, I would have written about more because I'm thinking about this. He had a tough time uh, when he was with the, the Negro League uh, in, a, in the sense of cultural time, not tough time as an athlete. Uh, clearly, he was a, a world-class athlete with other world-class athletes uh, in, in, at Kansas City. But he had a hard time with the lifestyle of uh, cavorting, uh, drinking, um, and, and so forth. And so clearly, I thought about this a lot that his Methodism uh, re and his college education kind of reflected uh, his kind of uh, uh, middle class sensibilities, sort of, uh, sort of speak. He's not, he doesn't reflect the working life. But I also think it's about uh, his spirituality. He remains um, highly uh, committed uh, uh, to uh, Rachel. Uh, even on the road with the, the players where, um, and, you know, some of the other players think he's just a, a, a do-gooder. So I do think there, there's something about uh, his spirituality that is coming through there. And he does attend church. He does talk about praying every night. I mean, these are sort of private expressions. Um, and, 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 and you're absolutely right. You know, here is this great black pride that we don't talk about with Robinson as much that he's, he's with the Negro leagues and they stop for gas and they try to use the restroom and they're told they can't use the restroom. And Robinson says, well, we're going to go buy our gas someplace else. We're not going to, we're only going to buy the gas when we're allowed to use the restrooms. He stands up. There is this feeling of black pride. There is this there is this feeling of his religion, as Randall mentions, when he's traveling. And at one point, he gets he gets frustrated with the drinking and carousing, and 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 takes, I believe, it's a glass of whiskey from somebody and throws it into the fireplace to make his point about the dangers of whiskey. He is this he, he is this do-gooder with 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 a competitor's soul. <laughs> um, uh, how else in your you know, where else does or do we see Robinson uh, expressing his, his his spirituality? Sort of a sacrifice and suffering. Sure. Uh, Rachel talked about it, his practice of piety, I guess, in the early years. Uh, it was intensely private in the sense that he would go into their apartment late at night and get and get down on his knees next to the bed and pray for strength so that he could continue on in the days to follow. You know, Robinson, if you read his columns, he talks quite a bit about God, uh, which is always really interesting to me. But he had this overarching sense that his prowess, his athletic prowess was a gift from God. And he talks about this time and again and that he had an obligation uh, to embrace that gift and to use it to the fullest of his abilities. And that comes through again and again. So I think just his hard work on the diamond is probably another expression of his faith. He, he, he also said that he wasn't the most religious person in the world. And I don't know, I wish I knew what he meant by that. I don't know what he means by that. And I often think, Damn, I wish other people weren't as religious as Robinson. This would be a much better world. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, Michael, I actually believed he thought that uh, that um, that the, the overexpression of that piety sometimes uh, got in people's way. I mean, he he really, he you know, he didn't go to uh, after after Downs died. He didn't go to church as much. But he he imbibed all of those 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 values that uh, and he kept uh, he kept those up. I don't I don't I think I think he still had a view of 
you know, many, there are many forms of piety and people who are overt in their pi piety uh, can be sometimes insufferable, as we all know, uh, when, because it becomes a kind of performance. And I think he, he, he didn't seek to make that as a, as a performance. Uh, and I think we also ought to compare him to, you know, many other uh, uh, athletes. You know, I wrote a book about the live religion of, of so, uh, entertainers and including Muhammad Ali, a uh, book called Faith and Struggle in the Lives of Four African Americans. And people have expressions of their faith in, in, in different kinds of ways. And I, I think he didn't want to just wear it on his sleeve. Carmen, you want to one thing I don't want to just interrupt for one second, Mike. Uh, out there in Zoom land, if you have questions, if you have comments, please let us uh, uh, please let us know. And, and and back to you, Mike. I know you want to finish up. No, I was just interested in Carmen's take on this. Well, thank you. I mean, I, as as a Roman Catholic, I find fascinating to listen to the conversation about his Methodism, and I I guess what my concern becomes is that. The exemplariness of Robinson can cause us to ignore the fact that suffering was imposed upon people that should not have been imposed. And I think sometimes when, and, and, and it's, it's a really a strategic maneuver that institutions free themselves of their sins by setting up an exemplar so they can say that it has been accomplished once and for all. And I actually find Robinson's spirituality in this sort of thread of resistance that, that sometimes doesn't get paid attention to because even to the notion of turn the other cheek, Robinson resists from the beginning. He says, turn the other cheek, but it can't be an Uncle Tom where I don't do this because I'm expected to do that. Um, if you read the book that comes out in 1964, that book is, um, Baseball Has Done It. So at one level, you can read it as a salutatory history of baseball integrating, but read the stories. They're all about the suffering of black players and Afro-Latino players who integrated and played in those years of gradualism set in motion by Branch Rickey. And, and that whole notion that there is one, he must be a martyr. Okay, it's done and everybody then forgets well, no, Orestes Minoso suffered. <laughs> he suffered horribly, you know. Um, as he did have suffered. <laughs> they, they, Roy Campanella suffered unnecessarily. Um, Elston, Vic Power, who would have been the first black to integrate the New York Yankees, wasn't the right Yankee. Well, he wasn't the right black <laughs> because he talked back. And then poor Elston Howard becomes that person who integrates and then like Robinson dies young because he has to swallow constantly. So you can resist, but you're also resistant at the same moment you're having to swallow. And, and I think there's, um, there's a, a scholar, she's a legal scholar, Phoebe Weaver Williams, who talks about this kind of notion where imposed suffering can either be imposed and then folks try to make sense out of it to give it a redemptive meaning, but that doesn't take away the sin of those who imposed it. And, and, and my concern is that, especially for those doing the imposing, we can go feel better about ourselves and say, hey, it's great. Look, Jackie Robinson fought racism. It's done now. And it's not done. Let's look at the numbers in the major leagues today. Let's look at the tension between African-American, Afro-Latino, African-Caribbean uh, ballplayers, where who's considered black, who's not? How does Spanish mitigate your blackness? I mean, all of this gets set in motion between 1947 and 1959. Why does it take 12 years <laughs> in the great major league baseball? And why is Robinson telling the stories of suffering in 1964? And I think he's kind of, I, I almost from my read of him, I find him resisting and trying to make sense out of this world that he's tried to open up as, as all of you have explained so beautifully, but he's still trying to make sense. And, and, and the saddest story about Robinson is that he's um, the, like, I think it's a month before he dies. He's finally invited to the World Series to be honored in Los Angeles, the Dodgers. 
And uh, somebody, they, you know, they throw the ball at him. Well, he's blind because of diabetes by now. He doesn't see it. He gets hit in the head with the ball. <laughs> and then he's dead, like weeks after that World Series. And, and, and I want to say is that we martyred the young Jackie Robinson for one event that was imposed upon him, the suffering piece. Now, I think he's an extraordinary player, hero, have his baseball card and all that. But we don't want to remember Jackie Robinson getting beamed by a baseball when he's being honored way too late because that too was gradual. And he's long dead. Orestes Minoso doesn't make the Hall of Fame until he's dead and would be like, what, 96? And, and I'm saying is that there's something there that the beauty and power of the stories of these heroes can especially cause those complicit in the sin that enabled racism that caused baseball to be reintegrated. It can just kind of give a pass. And that's my concern. So I celebrate everything that you say. In fact, yeah. I'm gonna you know, support it. But my concern is who takes the memory and who takes the story and does something else with it? And you how know, Carmen, is religion complicit? That's, I, know, guess Carmen, I, I, wanna, that. I wanna jump in here because this be, re, really goes home. My, my father uh, was um, uh, an umpire and he should have been the second umpire to come up uh, in the league. Um, and um, he always was grateful to Mr. I'm not making this up y'all, y'all can look it up. Uh, it, and he was always grateful to Mr. Robinson uh, for that opportunity. Uh, but uh, he um, is supposed to come up. And uh, of course, the president of the National League, it, his name escapes me for uh, a, a moment, doesn't want a black umpire up. So these struggles, my father probably, this was his dream to be, and he has spent time um, in the, the Pacific Coast League with the other black umpires. There were three of them. Uh, Emmett Ashford is the first in the American League. And um, so th these stories of martyrdom, they continue. Uh, and my father um, rarely talked about, you know, having his dreams dashed. He spent from 1956 to 69 in, 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 in the league. So it went on after Robinson. It wasn't uh, like, uh, suddenly major league baseball became some kind of progressive uh, vehicle. And, you know, uh, when Branch Rickey and the Dodgers want to, to build their new stadium, they displace a largely Latino community. Um, and so baseball is big business and there's a lot of good pious people, but you're right, that narrative of these ongoing people, people that we, who are written out the history books of, of a sort um, are, are still still there. And I, I think that's, that's a point well taken. If my aunt worked with the Yankees when Elston Howard played. And um, she, she, my aunt's 96 now. And she, she told me the story about a year or so ago because she worked for the head of public relations, a guy by the name of Bob Fischel who then went on to the league where um, they're in Florida, which was segregated. You know, they'd go to spring training and, and there were certain country clubs and restaurants that wouldn't allow. And um, Elson Howard was trying to leave, get like a, a, um, a reservation at a restaurant and was denied. And so official calls and basically saying to the effect of, he's our guests and if he doesn't have his table, then no Yankee will leave here again, kind of a thing. And, and, and that's like my aunt. <laughs> Who I'm talking to, like your, your like, like your, like your um, dad, and and those stories have have kind of been overshadowed because if the narrative can focus on one, and that's why I really respect Robinson because in 1964, when he could just write it out, he's calling attention to these stories of these folks. He talks about Aaron. He talks about Minoso, Vic, pa who gets his name changed, Vic Power, and he's telling these stories. And while he includes Ricky and some of the officials from the league, he's also then saying, and I don't understand why we don't have managers. And I don't understand why we're not in the front office. And how come there's only one secretary? Or why is it just the groundskeeping person? 
And so, and I think we forget that part that, that he keeps pushing and pushing through his whole life until the end where everybody remembers the part of him saying, you know, I don't know that I would like stand for the anthem anymore or salute the flag. Well, there's a context to get to that point. And I, and I think sometimes Major League Baseball doesn't want to remember that. So we celebrate Robinson his first year. And I think we do the same with Roberto Clemente. We celebrate Clemente backwards. Clemente would not be celebrated if he, his plane doesn't fall into the sea because he was pretty much tortured all the way through by the press, et cetera. And, and again, so you got a martyr at this end because he did something humanitarian and died doing it and a martyr at this end who did something. And my question is, why did we need martyrs unnecessarily when baseball should have done what was right all along? And, and the economic piece, I think that you raised Randall is very key, but the other piece that's missing is Ricky did not want legislative interference in the integration of baseball because the Quinn Ivers Act would have taken care of the Yankees, the Giants and the Dodgers. And even in the fifties, you have an, an interview in Milwaukee of you have Ricky talking about how he does not want legislative interference to make sure that the right thing has to be done by teams. And which, you know, that was part of who Ricky was as well. So I'm not trying to make him out to be a demon, but I'm just saying the narratives are so complex. I wonder, I actually think it raises um, Robinson in, in estimation to when you, when you put kind of all of those pieces together, because it says, my God, you know, how? And those who came after that you continue to care and raise the, you know, he wasn't in it for himself. Um, Weaver Williams talks about how folks are then made to think that the only way I can survive this is then to do it for my mom. And you have, and you have Robinson saying those words, I'm doing it for my mom, I'm doing it for Rachel, I'm doing it for my kids, I'm doing it for black kids everywhere so that everybody has a chance. Because otherwise, why am I taking this abuse? Um, and, and, and I think that's kind of important to remember. Yeah. I, I agree, uh, 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 Carmen. Uh, and I also, uh, historically, Methodism, I just wanted to know, uh, uh, it, it's always uh, has been seen as a, a, uh, a kind of appeasing Protestantism because it begins in the Industrial Revolution in, in England. Um, and so to, to calm, to calm the, the working class down, uh, at least that's a, what it has been accused of. And at times I, I think it's absolutely right. This is why I included uh, the kind of versions of Methodism that uh, black Methodists uh, take on uh, um, in, in their own, own kind of ways uh, because it becomes um, a more empowering uh, kinds of ways. But you're absolutely right, uh, and, and, and thank you for uh, uh, what you added to this. I, don't know I think we have a question, but real quickly, I think the real tragedy is that we continue to live in in sort of a white lens. Mm -hmm. uh, we continue the idea that Martin Luther King is only loved when he's assassinated, and Martin and Muhammad Ali is only loved when he has Parkinson's disease, and Jackie Robinson is only loved when you know, when, you know, when he is following what Branch Rickey wants him to do and God help Colin Kaepernick. Um, but we have a question here about on Facebook about uh, Robinson's legacy. When you compare him to athletes like Tiger Woods and, and LeBron James, and is Jackie Robinson's integration moment used by the LBGTA athletes an icon to move their concerns forward? I I think there's, I mean, Tiger Woods and LeBron James are differently, but let me just toss that out to you as well. What, 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 uh, uh, what is Robin's legacy compared with Tiger Woods and LeBron James and, and how is the, the LGBTA uh, movement incorporating uh, Jackie Robinson? And we actually only have a few more minutes. Yeah, well, I, just very quickly, I will say that no, neither LeBron James or Tiger Woods had to be Jackie Robinson, and thank God for that. Um, in terms of LGBTA or LGBTQ, uh, the uh, the opening of doors to uh, uh, them 
some many athletes are already going through that, and it's a very difficult time uh, for them and 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 their expressions. Uh, anytime you're busting down doors, um, it's, it's 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 a pretty brutal process. Yeah, Jackie Robinson made everybody's life easier except his own, and and he did not need redemption; he redeemed us. Uh, what closing comments do you have, uh, Randall, Carmen, and, and Mike, I, or, or if there are any questions out there, I'd like to hear from you. Well, I just think that um, there's so much more to um, Mr. Robinson. My dad would not want me calling him Jackie. <laughs> Mr. Robinson. Uh, and and I, I think that um, people aren't one dimensional. And I think neither the owners or the players or any other thing. So we, we, we can cut that, that narrative out. I suppose uh, I would simply add that when we look at Robinson's faith in particular, uh, it's good to remember what faith can be like uh, in a broader way. Uh, for many Christians like Robinson, uh, faith is something to comfort. And so clearly Robinson did turn to his faith uh, for comfort during those really difficult times that we've talked about. But especially in his later years, uh, after baseball, he turned to his faith as a point of challenge. And he appealed to people's faith uh, to challenge them, to uh, push the advance. Uh, for first-class citizenship, for Black Americans especially. So for Robinson, uh, faith wasn't just a point of comfort. It was especially, it seems to me, a point of challenge. Uh, uh, Carmen, how about you? It, it, it's funny how I think that when we, when we look at, at, um, at, at sports, for example, and anything in the area of lo popular, you know, we, we sort of get the sense that religion can be an add-on or religion um, has nothing to do with it, or we separate things into the worlds of sacred and secular. And I think something like looking at the life of Jackie Robinson, um, his relationships with his family, with French Ricky, with other folks and what he did in, in the complexity and the totality of his life is a way of illustrating um, also how religious threads run throughout. And, and that, you know, like, like we say, in, 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 at least in Latino theologies is good luck separating out the popular religion from the popular, from popular culture, from politics, from, you can't. It's like, you know, this is a big ball. You, you pull one thread, it, you're not going to, it, it's, you can't. So I think that it's a way of bringing back um, attention that, that it's, it's not helpful to separate out, but if we're looking at the integral whole and through a lens of the person of Jackie Robinson and his, and his contributions, his life, and then also what he had to endure, um, gives us a way of understanding sport and religion, sport and theology um, in a more complex ways as being part of the fullness of daily living. And that that's an important thing to, to be paying attention to. And in the case when we're talking about issues of race and um, underrepresented folks, we're also talking about how we need to explore more critically what our religious traditions bring that could also actually ex ex extend, deepen, and make suffering, unnecessary suffering, um, such a part that we actually, that, that it's destructive, that we cause people to accept violence and abuse. And I think that, that also is called attention. Well, I think just in closing, um, you, you know, the idea that uh, we've accepted uh, religion and sports as long as it tends to be white conservative Christianity. And that there's sort of this, how often do you see a player on a winning team thank God for his team's victory? I mean, what if you're on the losing side? You've given all you have in this game and you realize that God has forsaken you. But thank you all. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And thank you so much, uh, Carmen, uh, Randall, and Mike for making this hour just be so much fun for me. Uh, and please fill out your surveys and stay tuned for the religion and spirituality in museums on April 21st. Thank you all. And thank you, Joseph, uh, for bringing this together.